to another episode of Relics Radio. This is a family-friendly show, so the entire family can join us as we talk metal detecting, relic, and treasure hunting. You can also call into the show at 270-495-0315 or join in the chat and post any comments or questions you might have. Relics Radio is also now syndicated on the Cutting Edge Radio Network, and is broadcast around the world. You're listening to Relics Radio of Southern Kentucky and Middle Tennessee. And you are listening to Relics Radio once again. I want to welcome all of our live listeners that are tuned in on the Spreaker app. Also want to welcome all of our syndicated listeners on the Cutting Edge Radio Network, wherever you are. And we know that everybody can't catch the show live, so we'll have some people that have to catch the archive on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcast. Wherever podcasts are, we're there because we are the world famous Relics Radio. And I am digging with seven. I am your host. And I am Tennessee Jeff, your co host. How's it going, buddy? Uh, pretty good. Hot down here in the South right now, I tell you. Hot? Uh, that's not even, I mean, it's hotter <laughs> than hot. I, I, I just don't know. I was out a little bit today and then uh, trying to mess with my lawn more and then uh, the tires was melted off of it, so I just come back in. So. <laughs> triple digits in uh in the heat index right now and it's going to be that way i think on through sunday we're supposed to have rain again on sunday but uh uh it is hot i tell you it is it it's too hot to get out and do anything unless you're in the water you know the other day it was it was so hot and it was raining outside and i went out and just got some rain water and made tea with the rain water it's so hot so <laughs> it worked out pretty good <laughs> You crazy thing, you. I tell you. Uh, I, n- neither one of us, I don't guess. Well, I did get out. I went to the 44 Woods, but my pinpointer has gone out, and Half Redneck sent me one, and I'm not going to give you the name of it because uh, it's the sorriest pinpointer I've ever seen in my life. You can get an inch from a Cohen, and you still can't hear the thing. And so uh, I scratched around in the dirt, and finally, just uh, I had an old uh, I had an old Garrett, uh, one of the old black ones in the car, and I tried to use it, and it it was about the same way. And so I I did like we did way back in the old days. I'd take my hand and get a little bit of dirt, you know, and put it over the coil. And uh, I finally gave up on that. I was wringing wet with sweat, and I just finally gave it up and and came on in. But I don't guess you've hunted either, have you? No, I haven't hunted any. It's just been too hot and had too much stuff going on with uh, my parents and stuff. And then, but uh, yeah, Mark said I think that was the uh, pinpointer that he bought at a yard sale when he was twelve. He said <laughs> <laughs> he said it was terrible. And then, uh, of course, you know it's funny how dependable you get uh, real, uh, depend on a pinpointer once you have one. And of course, once you get one, I mean it's so much quicker. And oh, once yeah. you don't have it anymore, man, it takes forever to find a target. Yeah, I don't know how we hunted. I mean, I I'm, I know we did because uh, I can remember, you know, just taking a handful of soil and, and just putting your coil over there close to the hole and just uh, waving it over them until you could find it and then go through it. But, uh, yeah, you get spoilt, and Pinpointer is, uh, I mean, it's a critical piece of equipment. There's no doubt about it. But um, And I'm having a little bit of trouble with uh, the company is going to warranty it but I'm having a little bit of trouble getting a return merchandise uh, affidavit to send back in. They're kind of dragging their feet for some reason on that. So uh, I just bought me a Mind Lab uh, Profine 35 that will be here tomorrow. I've been wanting to try one of them anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. And, and I got me a new full-face snorkel mask. You've seen all that, didn't you? 
<laughs> yeah, you uh, posted a picture of it earlier. And, uh, um, Avery started crying. He thought that you was an alien or something. Didn't know what you were. I know it. I can't wait to get to the lake and try that thing out. And then I sent you a picture of my cat. It scared my cat to death, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it did. Uh, they all run off, didn't they? Oh, yeah. And my great-grandson, he just looked at me, you know. Uh, he didn't cry, but he just kind of looked at me. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, probably – I don't think I'll go tonight after – uh, the show normally do on Thursday night. I think I'll wait till sometime tomorrow and run on down to the lake and try it out sometime tomorrow, maybe, and uh, Saturday then. And uh, the pinpointer should be here tomorrow. I kind of want to wait on it too. And and I wish I had one of them pulse dives. I'd just get under the water and just stay there for the four or five hours, you know. Yeah. Well, we'll find out if that snorkel mask doesn't work. Uh, this may be the last episode of Relics Radio. So. <laughs> yeah, guys, uh, if I'm not here next next week, you know that it didn't work. <laughs> so let's so make we've th- got a good show. Uh, yeah, let's planned. make let's make this one as as good as we can. Go ahead and bring our guest on. <laughs> we've got a great guest tonight, uh, Joe DeMarco, hey, uh, with uh, DeMarco Detector Sales. How's it going, Joe? Oh, going great, going great. Thanks for having me on, uh, Loy and Jeff. Yeah, we've been uh, looking we've been looking forward to this show right here, I tell you. We look forward to every show, but uh you uh you're an interesting character, I tell you. Uh, doing what background that we can on you. And uh I was looking today and by the way, guys, all of these uh sites on Facebook and everything that we put out, I put those in the description. And I'm gonna tell you something, Jeff. This guy's got as many uh Facebook pages and everything as I do. He does. I, I was going through a day four yesterday and I was like, This guy's everywhere and I was like <laughs> I was waiting to see a picture of him and Trump or somebody like that sitting there eating du- uh supper or something. But uh yeah, half redneck said you was gonna give us a bunch of freebies. I don't I don't know what he meant by that. But, so I guess he was gonna Give us a bunch of detectors and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I thought maybe that maybe that was free advice. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, well, we'll take that. That's just as good. <laughs> hey, let's so get let's, uh, yeah. Let's get started on the first uh, segment here. Go ahead, Jeff, and get him brought uh, in here on it. Uh, well, Joe, what got you into uh, interested in metal detecting and treasure hunting? Um, well, I'd have to say I was adventurous when I was younger. Um, I lived in. You know, in and around a lot of farms. So, you know, you, you kind of took your bike and you, you rode down the cornfields. And, you know, one day I heard about there was a, a cellar hole um, out in the middle of one of these fields. And, of course, I had to go find it. Um, <laughs> and I didn't even have a metal detector at the time. I, would, I just wanted to find that cellar hole that these guys have been talking about. Um, now, you got to remember, this was probably about age 12, 13, um, I didn't really get to use my first metal detector until I was about 14, um, and that was an old Radio Shack. Um, I remember it because uh, one of the neighbor kids had it, and we ended up taking it out to this cellar hole to see what we could find. Um, you know, it, 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 everything's got to start somewhere. Um, and I just think it's probably my adventurous spirit, um, just the excitement of, you know, they, we had found a lot of broken china around the cellar hole, and so, you know, we went down and were digging in the hole thinking that there was going to be some buried treasure in it. Um, to our surprise, it was just a bunch of uh, old trash that was dumped <laughs> into uh, the hole by a bunch of the the local farmers. Normally, that's how it is. I mean, it never fails. You you find a good spot and you think, man, this is going to be great, and then turns out it's just a bunch of uh, modern trash. So, do you remember if you, you guys found any uh, uh, good things at this cellar hole? Um, could... Yeah, there were uh, old irons, the old ones that you would put on a pot belly stove. Uh, there were. Uh, a lot of the iron relics were still, you know, around the area because all they did was they tore the house out. Um, out in the front still had some uh, remnants of the sidewalk uh, leading up to what was the front of the house because of the, you know, horses had left a trail going across the front where it was just where the wagons had left the rail marks from the wheels. 
Um, so you could actually follow that and looking across the field and tell the difference in the materials um, that led to the house. Uh, just because of the colors, uh, even though they plowed it for years, you still had the darker color right where the horses spent most of the time walking across. Man, that, that's pretty neat. You can, I mean, you can go through and just make out what the way it was when the house still stood. So that that's pretty neat. You know, I've uh, I've used uh, Google Earth uh, some in my research, and uh, if you get a uh, view on Google Earth that was in the, that was taken in the summer. And uh, you can go up in the left-hand column on uh, some versions of Google Earth and change the year. And if they took it in the summer, there's been one or two sites where you can actually see the darker coloration of the ground right where the old house site would have been. Because, well, you know, they they threw trash out and uh, there was just occupation. There was a little bit of everything going on there. So the ground's going to be a little different. And I guess that's what you're talking about, isn't it, Joe? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, there's another uh, website that's even better. It's called Historical Aerials. Um, Historical Aerials actually goes back further than what Google does, and you have a slider bar that you can pick different periods of time year-wise um, as to the changes and then slide the bar back and forth to see what it looked like maybe 40, 50 years ago to what it looks like 10 years ago yeah yeah we use uh, that as well and it's it is it, it's a it's a great tool whole lot of tools whenever it comes to research isn't there well every every tool in your toolbox helps yep um you know it, detecting in in southern new jersey has been going on for 20 30 years um you know and it's really inspired a lot of people families to get out and enjoy it um but with that you have a lot of areas that have been covered or detected at some point in time uh be it with a expensive detector or be it with a beginner detector um there's you know you you have to take it in stride that someone has been there detecting that at some point in time um, but I think that that's just part of the history of New Jersey being one of the 13 original colonies. Yeah, y'all, you you guys have a lot of history there that we don't, a lot of older history that we don't have uh, here. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know, but uh, Kentucky and Tennessee was a colony for a little while called the uh, Transylvania Colony. And uh, there was a uh, development group, I guess you would call it, out of North Carolina that negotiated with some Indians and bought most of what today is Kentucky and, and Tennessee, especially the the center section of both of those, the middle parts. And uh, But come to find out, those Indians, <laughs> they weren't qualified to sell it. And so uh, Transylvania didn't last very long. <laughs> it didn't last long at all. And then... Finally, well, we know, we know the histories behind that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, go ahead, Joe. But yeah, there's there's a lot of different history. I mean, I've seen some coins that have come through my detecting detector sale shop um, that you just wouldn't believe the the quality and just some of these coins you'll never see. Um, you know, when you talk about a half Disney, we had one that was found locally that I was able to see and actually touch and hold. So, you know, that's a piece of history that <laughs> you'll you'll never get to really feel the emotion of that. I don't even know what that is. Yeah. For a minute there, I started to tell you I got half dizzy not having a pinpointer. <laughs> <laughs> what is that coin? Uh, the half dizzy was a coin that was made from George Washington and Martha Washington silver. Um, they were pr- they were done specifically for Washington. 
Um, I'm trying to remember the year 70. It was it was just about the time of the U.S. start of currency. I, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. It was somewhere around, uh, it was prior to 1794, I think. Uh, yeah. Somewhere right in there. I, and uh, that is the half dime now. It, it's, yes. it's, or later, it was the half dime. But it was called the Disney at first. Which meant yes. which meant ten, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about there. Now you had me there for a minute, though. <laughs> you, you had me half dizzy. Hey guys, <laughs> we need to uh, take a commercial break, and we'll be right back. You know, T-shirts are a perfect way to get your brand recognized. Whether you're talking about a business, a club, a sports team, your YouTube channel, or whatever. But you may have asked, where can I get quality, affordable shirts on demand? Well, I'm glad you asked. Relics Radio uses DetectTees.com for all of our T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, and hoodies. That's D-E-T-E-C-T-E-E-S.com. Ken and Mark Guthrie make quality shirts that last, they ship quick, and best of all, they're affordable. So if you need customized apparel, then go to DetectTees.com and be sure and tell them that Relics Radio sent you. And by the way, guys, if you go to the Relics Radio Facebook group page, you're going to see that DetectTees is now making the Relics Radio cooling towels. And I tell you what, those things are fabulous. Of course, they're still making the uh, T-shirts as well. And uh, they are great. The the hoodies will be coming out again this fall and this winter. They are outstanding. They just make a lot of outstanding stuff, don't they, Jeff? They sure do. And then I'm gonna have to get me another hoodie because I'm on this keto diet, and uh, of course I've lost a little bit of weight. And the one I've got now is a little big for me. So, and then uh, uh, half redneck in there. Put the uh, the half Disney's were made for a half redneck. So that was pretty <laughs> I guess they <laughs> so, were. Yeah. So, Joe, getting back uh, segment number two, uh, favorite types of detecting uh, locations. What, you, which one do you prefer, uh, land or water? Or well, I can tell you, it depends on the time of year. Um, here, a, a lot of us do all types. Um, in the summertime, this time of year, we're beach hunting and water hunting. Because we can't get into the farm fields, we can't get into the woods um, because of chiggers and ticks and snakes and all the other wonderful creatures that uh, inhabit our woods. Uh, so it, it's the beaches and the water. And yeah. that's actually where I feel most comfortable. Um, because over the years of detecting, um, I just find it more relaxing to be detecting in the water. Um, it, it's tough. That's why a lot of people don't do it. But it opens up a whole new area for a lot of detectors. You know, it really does. And, of course, around here, I'll, I'll get in the creeks every now and then. And, of course, you you'll, you can go over a lot of uh, uh, land that way and then just see if you can find old bottle dumps along the creeks. But my problem, if I get along the uh, uh, beaches and stuff like that, I just want to take in the beach scenes I, I, and just enjoy the uh, waves and stuff. And it, it's hard for me to detect on the beaches. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer will slap you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I thought maybe you were going during the day when there's uh, the sights to see. And... <laughs> <laughs> well, let me rephrase that. I, I'm just looking at the waves. <laughs> Hey, Joe, what, what kind of machine do you like to use in the water? Um, well, as times change, machines change. Right. Um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to create an underwater uh, explorer back in uh, 2007-ish. Um, when the only thing that really was in the water was an Excalibur. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Raymond Keith, Charles Keith, he created a, a way to seal the housing um, within inside of a, um, a, a plastic that made all the buttons usable. 
um, and I convinced him to make one for me. Um, so, you know, that was a great experience, getting out in the water with a land machine that had the kind of power that the explorers had at that time period. Um, but, you know, before that, we were swinging single-frequency detectors. Um, you know, your Tesoros were the gold-finding monsters of the water. Yeah. Especially uh, freshwater. Yeah. Um, I, uh, everything grows in time. Um, I've grown through uh, the waterproof explorer that I had built, the uh, <laughs> CTX. Now I'm actually really liking the Equinox in the water. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't, uh, well, I've had mine in the lake, my Equinox, but I, I haven't been to the beach with my Equinox yet, but... Uh, you know, from what I understand, it's it's just a it's a great detector. And in the chat, Ringfinder was wanting to know what year was that that you uh, helped make the uh, waterproof? Uh, what was that? A Nextera, did you say, or what? No, that was an Explorer. Oh, okay. And I actually and I actually still have it. Oh, really? Um, yeah, it's it was a machine that we we created. Um, it's powered by an Excalibur battery. Um, that way we can change it out. It had waterproof connectors, so we could change the coils. Um, there, he only made, I think it was three of them, one for himself, one for me, and one for someone else. Um, but uh, it would have probably been about 07. 07. They're guessing yeah, in. Thomas, yeah, in yeah, they're guessing in the chat here. Uh, the the year of that. Now, what evolution have you gone through? Uh, you said something about the uh, about the CTX. I had a CTX. I I paid too much for it. I was afraid to put it in the water, but uh, I know it was a good water machine. Uh, have you just settled on the Equinox now? Well, this time of year with fresh drops. Um, things are not extremely deep. Um, the CTX, as much as I love the machine, and it's a depth monster, it just does not see those gold chains without something else on it. Um, and for years, we've just been digging the pendants in a lot of these swimming areas and weren't digging the gold chains. Well, now we're going back to those same swinging, swimming areas and pulling those gold chains that we never saw with the other technologies. Yeah. Well, what coil are you using on the Equinox? I am using a stock coil. Stock coil. Let me in. Even, yeah, yeah. Even, even on my CTX, I could get just as much depth with the stock coil as guys were getting with the 17. Um, and I had created some programs for the CTX primarily for beach hunting. Um, which uh, those that did have my program can probably attest to the fact that it's a lot better than coming right out of the box. Uh, it makes it so much easier to learn the machine and dig the targets they're looking for. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of the sentiment around here is the beach is fun to help pay for your toys, but relic hunting and field hunting is what goes in your collection yeah well that's true i mean that it is, is true I, I never thought of that but that is really true i mean i mean you find a lot of stuff that like new stuff on the beach that you could just turn around and pay for your uh, toys right yeah and uh you know you get those storms that come in that you guys get the nor'easters i guess is what gives you the best uh erosion of sand and everything isn't it and then you get yeah. down to hard pan and and then you're in a bonanza oh yeah there there are points in time when you can spend three hours and not move 30 feet wow just because the pure number of targets that are <coughs> down in the clay yeah uh because once things settle into the clay uh, and it, it does take some pretty massive storms for that to happen, uh, I can go back to when Sandy came through. Uh, a day later, I was out on the beach detecting, and I was pulling silver coins. 
Um, and it was just like you were going out there and digging clad today. Uh, Good. It was right. just silver coins all over the place because the dunes got washed out. Um, I mean, and you could you could literally see them on the top if you knew what you were looking for. Man, what's some of your oldest coins that you've pulled out of South Jersey? Uh, beach or land? Beach. Uh, I've got over 300 Spanish eight reals. Really? Good. <laughs> Lloyd, gracious. Oh God, man, that took my breath. Well, Lloyd, you, we're you, in the wrong spot. <laughs> well, Joe, you've been a wonderful guest. We're going to have to say good night to you now, though. Goodness gracious. 300 well, eight reals. Here's, here's the... Here's, let me. I have to explain it because it's the Corps of Engineers and our beaches get replenished quite often. Uh, they used to not really pay much attention to what they were putting on the beach. Um, it just happened after a storm. We went down and we started hitting eight reals. I can tell you I hunted that beach for a year and a half as it was eroding. And so we're probably another five or six people, but we kind of kept it quiet. We didn't advertise it, um, and we were pulling Spanish eight reals. Seventeen uh, seventies, I think my oldest one was seventeen fifty two. Um, but I, in that same beach, I also pulled seven gold coins. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. It, after that happens, you kind of get spoiled um, as to, you know, just picking up clad coins on the beach. Well, I want to be spoiled. Yeah, I, I want to be spoiled, too. Let me ask you a question, though. Was Were those dropped there in that area, or was it saying that they had moved in from somewhere else? What's your opinion as to why all of those old coins were where you found them? My opinion is that the dredge went over something and pumped them onto the beach. Um, and it's not just on, you know, a little one-block area. I mean, we were finding them probably 15 blocks worth of this style of target. Yeah. Um, because they were moving sand. They were just pumping sand. They were doing their job. So that have replenished the beach. Yeah. Have you have you been out offshore to where they pumped that sand from? Um, well, there's been a few guys that have said that they have dove on that area uh, because they got the log from the dredge company as to where they were during that replenishment. Uh, but they said that there's so many other wrecks that are named and unnamed that you couldn't really put a name to it. Uh, but everyone tends to believe that it was from the fame, um, which was, you know, a, pi a, a privateer. And that's where they believe it came from. Now, I have a, a spoon that I dug that has an insignia on it that we've been trying to trace for I don't know, the past six years. So uh, it is a piece of the history. Um, it was dated from the 1730s, from the maker's marks. Um, so we're, we're just trying to chase that down. If we can chase down what that ship was or if it actually existed, um, and then where its cargo was and what ship its cargoes were on, then we can narrow down uh, the search on what the ship actually was, but they didn't. They didn't have very good record keeping back then. No, I don't guess they did. And what kind of depth are you talking about? Not the shipwreck, but uh, what kind of depth on when you were finding the eight reals and everything? And was it after a storm? Uh, it wasn't really after a storm. I mean, this went on for a year and a half. Of a bunch of us, we would hit it every other tide or. And we pull one or two. I think my best day there was when me and Charles got into a, a hole, and I think we dug like 62 out of this one hole. Um, because when they when they pump, they're heavy. These, these coins are heavy, so 
they'll get into piles and they will just sink down in the slurry. Um, and as the beach eroded back, that's when you would find targets. Yeah. Now they wouldn't be, um, you know, some of them would be screaming targets. Other, others would be a light whisper. Uh, but there was some people who had recorded themselves finding out on this beach and it kind of, uh, it blew up the area. Next storm, there'd be 30, 35 people out on that beach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hard to keep a secret like that, I tell you. Hey, guys, we need to run another commercial. We'll be right back. If your passion is metal detecting, then you know how much your success is based on the equipment you use. Let my buddy Tim Henderson of Murray Branch Outdoors in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, help you with that. Tim is an authorized dealer of Mine Lab, Garrett, XP Deus, and Macro Detectors and Supplies, and also carries many aftermarket items. Murray Branch Outdoors is not only competitive in their prices, but the service after the sale is second to none. Tim not only sells detectors, he uses them, and so he can answer any question that you might have. Murray Branch Outdoors also deals in used detectors, and he'll take your old detector in on trade when you decide to upgrade. So give Tim Henderson of Murray Branch Outdoors a call at 615-948-4611 or visit his website at www.murraybranchoutdoors.com. And be sure and tell him Relics Radio sent you. And I know that you guys were listening whenever we were, Joe was talking about finding all of those reals and the gold coins and everything. And you just got the fever, don't you? You want to get out there and detect. Call Tim Henderson of Murray Branch Outdoors. He'll fix you up with a water machine, a land machine, whatever kind of machine that you need. And uh, by the way, his information also is in the description, as are all of our sponsors. Uh, amazing, isn't it? Go ahead, Jeff, and uh, bring us on in to our next segment here. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, DeMarco Detector Sales and uh, 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 how it got started and all that. Well, let me give you a little history on, on that and myself then. All right. Um, all right. Uh, well, for years, um, there's, there hasn't been a lot of detector shops in my area. Um, I bought most of my detectors coming up through were from yard sales. Um, I bought my first one back in 1994. Well, when I started looking around for accessories, I couldn't find anywhere to, to get them unless, you know, I went to a magazine and I called and had it sent to me. Um, so the following year in 1995, I started the Marco detector sales. Um, our first brand that we carried, and this is why I say that, you know, <coughs> through the years you make changes, the first year um, or the first brand that we brought in was Tesoro. Tesoro was the first brand that we carried. Um, at that point in time, I was with Detector Electronics up in Massachusetts. I was a dealer of theirs. Um, then the business started growing from there. We, we started carrying MindLab products. Um, shortly thereafter, um, at the time, I was the youngest dealer that the manufacturers had. Um, I was 25 years old and, you know, full of pep and, you know, where am I going from here? Um, and then about 2001, we made a considerable, we got a considerable opportunity Um, we were offered the opportunity to buy metaldetecting.com. And we we jumped on that opportunity. Um, Since then, we've been building the business through uh, customer service and our reputation um, for helping people, uh, for actually our ability to get out there. And we weren't just trying to sell products. We were actually using products. Um, So it's an exciting process thing uh and i wanted to share the excitement that i had for the hobby with those that were just starting because after a while you start to get complacent when you know you've dug your thousandth indian head 
But to that guy just starting out, that first one is so exciting to him. It's it's more exciting to me to see that guy find that Indian head than for me to dig one myself anymore. Um, but that comes without saying because you get spoiled by some of the stuff that you do find. After you're the one that does research, find spots, go out, you hunt them, you, you're starting to dig coins from the 1700s, and someone gets excited about a coin from 1890s. Um, I haven't really found a key date coin yet, but, you know, I'm still searching. <laughs> I know what you're. I know what you're talking about because uh, Jeff and I had a guy that came from. Uh, well, I guess he lives in uh, Kansas now, doesn't he? But mm-hmm. anyway, he's he's got some relatives that live in Middle, Middle Tennessee, and he reached out to us and said that he was coming. He had never found a Colonial flat button, and uh, so we went to an old Colonial site that me and Jeff have hunted, and we've hunted it hard. But we did find some stuff, and Jeff found a, a really good find there. But anyway, I was hoping that this guy would find a uh, a flat button, and we hunted for a couple of hours, and he had found some stuff. He found a, a mercury dime that had probably been lost by a hunter or a farmer or something, and he found a few other things. And uh, But he hadn't found a flat button yet, and I'd already found three. And so I got a good signal, and, and I was pretty sure that it was a flat button. And I, I hollered at him, and I told him, I said, check this signal right here and listen to it. He listened to it, and he said, yeah, I said, it sounds good. I said, well, dig it. And so he dug it, and he was so excited. And, you know, I don't know how many flat buttons that I've got, but that would just be another one in the pile to me. But to him, it is his first and uh you know you just love to see that out of out of a, uh, a hunter that hadn't found something you know right right and it it's just i can tell you i've built a lot of friendships um through this hobby i've met some fantastic people um i've got some really great friends um, some of them have been on the show uh Drew and Jocelyn Matt and Maddie um the guys i hunt with Joe Farrell, uh, you know, Gene Hogan, you know, some of these guys, they started out being customers, and then the friendship grew from there, um, as, out of mutual respect, um, but that's what it's all about. If you, re- you respect each other, have a positive attitude, and enjoy the company of, of the people you're surrounding yourselves with, it makes it a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. Um, it does, and and uh, we we know most of those people that you mentioned, don't we, Jeff? We've had them on as guests, all great mm-hmm. people. Yeah, we've had them on as guests, and then, of course, it's like uh, doing this radio show. We've met so many people through this radio show, and then we've ended up hunting with a lot of people, and it, it it's just opened up a ton of friendships that, I mean, you never would have met if it hadn't been for this hobby, and then well, just trying to share each other's history. Right. And that's what actually started the DSJ. The the DSJ was started on an idea. I used to go around to a lot of these seated hunts. Um, I've been out to Treasure Week when it was out in Shreve, Ohio. Um, I've been down to the FMDA seed hunts from uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, to Virginia Beach. Um, You know, so I've gone out to a lot of them, and things have changed since that period of time because of silver and you know uh, the silver and gold prices going up um, after going to uh, hunt out in PA dirt dig in PA um, we were, I was discussing it with some people and and I decided you know what I'm going to do one I'm going to do one on my own property uh, we're going to make it back to the way it used to be um, so what we've done is we created the Dig in South Jersey hunt, uh, and we, we hold it annually uh, the weekend after Columbus Day. Um, and a matter of fact, the uh, registration for DSJ starts uh, Saturday. The registration form will go up tomorrow, and we expect to actually fill up again this year um it's <coughs> i mean I hate, to, 
I can't talk too much about it because uh, there's some exciting things going on that we're not at liberty to speak of yet. Um, but it's it's going to be a great time. Um, we have uh, some of the people that I mentioned are you have attended the last two years. Um, Debbie Smirkowski has uh, been here the last two years. Um, so I think maybe she'll be here again this year. Um, we're waiting to see. Uh, but it's it's all about the friendship and fellowship and hanging out with people and having a good time. And, um, you know, a lot of people start out with, oh, uh, a hunt, that's a great idea. Uh, well, then you look at the amount of work that goes into it. <laughs> um, fortunately... Uh, back in, I want to say it was 2011 and 12, we did the Go Mine Labbing hunt. The, they used to do a national one. We used to do it in Atlantic City. Uh, that event would bring in somewhere around 450 to 500 people for a beach hunt, uh, which Mine Lab sponsored. Mine Lab would... Uh, Let's just say they, foot the, they footed the bill. Uh, they did have a small fee, but their fee they turned around and they would donate it to some cause uh, that they felt best reflected, you know, what they would donate to. But it's, it's exciting. This year with uh, some teasers I've seen out there, I think it might be even more exciting. We'll see, I hope. Um, so it's, it's going to be a good time. Uh, we've also launched a couple of other, uh, social media groups, uh, going under the premise of let's talk, uh, which, you know, we, we're non, we're, we're no nonsense. You know, we just want to see people's finds. If you got a problem, let's talk about them. Uh, we've got plenty of, of I, I don't I hate to use the word expert um, because a lot of us are learning as we go. Just some of us learn faster than others, and just because somebody puts their coil over something that it doesn't make you an expert. Cool. Um, it just means that you got lucky. <laughs> uh, but it's. There's a lot of good people in these groups that we started, and you know, we've got friends in Canada, we've got friends in the Midwest, Florida. I mean, you name it. We we have friends that you know are willing to help if if needed. Um, we've also worked with the ring finders. We've worked with uh, handicapped groups. We worked with. Uh, some of the veterans organizations. So it's, it's a fun time, regardless if, if you look at it from a business standpoint or just being um, giving back to your community. And that's the way we look at it. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I did a, a, a drive for Christmas cards. I spent my Christmas Eve at a veteran's home passing out Christmas cards instead of, you know, being at home. Because I felt that that was a little more important than the one couple of hours that I was going to be spending away was going to make a big difference in somebody else's life. Uh, well, but, you know, that's all part of business. <laughs> yeah, that's well. Um, uh, in the uh, Diggin' South Jersey, that's October the 19th, right? I uh, oh, <coughs> actually, it is the eighteenth and nineteenth. Eighteenth and nineteenth. Okay. What yes. is the entry fee for? The yourself? entry fee will be a hundred dollars per person. Uh, and if it's a plus one, then the plus one can buy lunch for fifteen dollars. Because the lunch is is provided to all participants as part of their registration fee. Okay. And I noticed that uh, I was watching the video of you earlier, and y'all, uh, you're going to have several thousand silver coins planted, um, right? 
I can, <laughs> as of this moment, there's over 2,000. Last year, we put in over 17,000. Man. And then, of course, uh, uh, is the uh, seeded hunt is it going to be in the same location as it was last year? Uh, I'm yes, trying to get, if there's more yep. silver coins that wasn't found last year, they're still there. So Correct, correct. Um, this year we are, we, we've added Friday, but Friday is a, an evening event. Um, because it's going to be a Friday evening event, and then Saturday will be your all-out hunts. Uh, because of the fact that we have people that come in from all over the country, we felt that it's best to give them something to do on Friday night. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we've decided is that we were going to do a free evening hunt. Uh, we would supply pizza and there'll be other surprises. Sounds good. I tell you, it really does. <clears throat> we need well, to... if you go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, with, with the, with the lunch, it's normally pulled pork, burgers, dogs, potato salad, corn on the cob. Uh, and the the gentleman actually comes here with his smoker and cooks everything right here, on site. Hey, that's not bad. That, no, that sounds good. I tell you, hey guys, yeah. we need to uh, we need to run another commercial, and uh, we will be right back. <laughs> If you want to keep up with what's going on in the metal detecting world, then you need to be a subscriber to American Digger magazine. Butch and Anita Holcomb are the publishers of the magazine and have won awards for three straight years for being the best digger magazine on the market. American Digger magazine is available in both print and digital formats. So no matter where you live in the world, you can enjoy the latest happenings in the hobby. You can get in touch with American Digger Magazine by going to americandigger.com or give them a call at 770-362-8671. And be sure and tell them that you heard it on Relix Radio. And I must be the luckiest man in the world because I not only can do this show, but on Monday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, I am also the producer and one of the co-hosts on American Digger Relic Roundup with Butch Holcomb and Jeff Lupert. And by the way, we're all going to be there at the Chattanooga show July the 27th and 28th. We're going to do live shows for American Digger Relic Roundup. We're going to do live shows for Relics Radio. And we're also going to do some live show, a live show for History Seekers. And, Jeff, we haven't mentioned it, but we probably need to throw it in there real quick. If you guys haven't gone to the Relics Radio Facebook group page and seen the giveaway for the Pulse Dive, you need to go there. Comment with three words, and there are some other things you will read. I've got it posted right at the top of the page. Uh, post a three-word comment. I will give you a number on August uh, the 1st, I guess it is. We're going to draw for that. And uh, we've also got keywords. We gave one out last week. We're not going to tell you what that word was. But what is our second keyword, Jeff? Let's see. Let's make it mild. Okay, M-I-L-E, mile. That is our second uh, uh, keyword, and then there will be one more. Go ahead and take us into the next segment then, Jeff. All right, well, we had a question in the uh, chat room that uh, was asking, uh, Joe, are you uh, re- related to the uh, Barry DeMarcos from New Jersey area? Uh, no, no. We're, we're not related to the horse farm. We're not related to the undertaker. Uh, nor the horse farm or blueberries. <laughs> All right. So, but uh, only, there, go there are a lot of DeMarcos in this area. Um, it was a common Italian name uh, when you immigrated in because it was primarily they gave you the last name of the area of which you came. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you couldn't speak English, they kind of just gave you uh, DeMarco is you were... From, uh, of the Marco, 
Um, it's it's interesting. We've done a little history search, so we we were lucky enough to the family put an album together before the elders of the family passed away. So we were able to actually trace back the family tree. Wow, that's that's pretty neat. Milam, where Milam, where did that come from? Oh, never mind. I better not say. It came yeah. from Five Mile Holler. <laughs> 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 that's where it came from. All jokes All right. aside, that's that's where most of the Milams uh, met their demise was in Five Mile Holler. <laughs> Joe, can you tell us about the uh, Patriot headset? And what other, any other products you can tell us about? All right. Um, well. As as the name says, Patriot, um, I'm I have this thing for our military. Um, as you know, I don't only own uh, Demarco Detector Detector Sales Metal Detecting dot com. Um, I also have a full time job, which my full time job is law enforcement. Um, so. You know, I get to see a lot of the veteran issues um, through some of the the gentlemen I work with, um, some of the friends that I've made, uh, some of those with disabilities that I've worked with, and some of those that we have working with us. Um, The the Patriot name, that's where it came from. Um, And the design was because I felt, you know, there was it, it needed to be out there. Uh, we have veterans that come in and help us uh, build the headphones, uh, the drilling, and uh, whatever else we can do or what they can do. Um, and that's how that name came about. Now, we've only been doing Patriot headphones since July 4th of last year is when we announced it. Uh, but since then, the reviews that we've gotten... Um, are just fantastic. Um, I used to do some work with a previous uh, manufacturer, and we separated ways, uh, and I had an agreement with him that I wouldn't do anything for a year. Well, when that year came about, it was time for me to to start my ideas. Um, You know, this, (coughs) this headphone was... Probably about eight months in the in the process of from paper to actually getting it to work the way that I wanted to with quality and um, just the overall experience of using them, and it has it's paid off. Um, we're able to produce them here in my in the shop. Uh, we also, you know, have a few other people selling them dealer-wise, uh, but we have major dealers who actually want to handle them. Um, you know, we've been approached by several that uh, want to handle them, but we're want, we're we're about the small dealer. Um, I, I really don't want to have them going at this point because I'm not prepared to sell 300 at a time to bigger um, stores and I want to keep them in the smaller stores so that it brings in business to them. Um, Now, we do have an announcement for you tonight that Patriots have started with the Equinox Um, we've had a lot of requests for another model and next month you can look forward to the Equinox, or I'm sorry, the Patriot headphones coming out for the CTX. Um, we've had a lot of requests for them because everyone likes the quality of the sound, um, likes the crispness, the cleanness, um, so we're we're going to go ahead and we're going to produce them. I've been hesitant to you know step outside of my comfort level on this, uh, but we're going to have them out the middle of next month. So you can look forward to them being available um, through 
some of some of the dealers we currently have and watch our pages. Uh, we'll have some additional announcements coming um, that we're just not prepared to say too much about at this point in time. That's great. I tell you, uh, I've never used one of those, but uh, I've I've heard some good things about them from people that have. Hey, guys, we're going to do a giveaway, and uh, we're also going to open up the phone lines at 270-495-0315. But the uh, giveaway, Murray Branch Outdoors is going to throw in a Garrett dig bag, and then Detect Tease is going to throw in a Relics Radio cooling towel. It's a trivia question. And Joe, earlier in the show, named, a, and everybody's putting numbers in. Those guys are disqualified <laughs> already. <laughs> uh, Joe mentioned earlier in the show a land machine that he made into a water machine. What is the name of that machine? First person that puts that in wins a Garrett dig bag from Murray Branch Outdoors and a Relics Radio cooling towel from detectees.com. Uh, go ahead, Joe, and we'll watch the chat here and, and uh, break in in a minute. Well, you know, I I just enjoy detecting. That's that's how this all started. That's where this continues to go. Um, but like I said, we're we posted out there uh, about three weeks ago about a, a scoop even that we we designed and are working with another company to build and. I wasn't surprised by the answers I got because those some of those answers are some additional builds that were already in the works. Um, so, you know, I think that I have a good read on what people want, and we just continue to try to produce products that we can, uh, that fill a need or fill a void. Um, unfortunately, you know, you, you can't always, uh, have a product that fits everyone's need, but you try to do it along the lines of what's going to best fit, uh, most needs. Yeah. And, and you know, those, those headphones and things that you make, they, they are machine specific, aren't they? And so, uh. Uh, that makes a difference, and so you know you you can't just make a a general product and uh, throw it out there for everything. Hey guys, we've got a winner. Who is it? Uh, Jeff? Mark Thomas. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was the Explorer. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Hey Mark. Mark Thomas. Reach out to uh, Mark Hoover, and he spells his with a C there on uh, on chat and. Uh, uh, you guys get together, and he'll get an address and everything, and he'll send it over. And you're going to get a, a Garrett dig bag from Murray Branch Outdoors, and you're going to get a Relics Radio cooling towel. You need that right now, as hot as it is, from DetectTees.com. And uh, DeMarco Detectors is going to give me a set of headphones. So that, it all worked out for us. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was watching videos on them headsets today, and they look pretty nice. I mean, of course, I like the long cord on them, and, and I mean, especially if you're in the water, and then say if your detector kind of drag well gets washed down a little bit, well, I mean, you've got plenty of room to uh, still hunt a little bit. So, well, and and that's what we designed into the Equinox. Um, we were lucky enough that uh, the the manufacturer actually signed off on allowing us to use the same manufacturer for our cables that they use for their cables. Um, so we made improvements. We made changes to fit our need. Um, our cable is fairly long, so it can actually go behind the armrest and then come up to the ear, uh, to the ear cup, so that you don't have that wire in front of you um it it's still got enough uh spring coil that if you were to you know accidentally stand up without grabbing your machine it's not going to yank the headphones off your ears or off your head yeah that's happened to me and seven so many times and then i mean 
we'll, we'll tr find something and we'll be excited about it and we'll try to show each other. Next thing you know, it jerks us back because our uh, detector's still laying on the ground. But, I mean, it looks like it's going to uh, be a great set of head, uh, headphones. Uh, I, well, I can't wait to try them out myself. We, we're, we're working on innovations um, always. Um, we hope, um, and please, nobody hold me to this, we're working on putting together some kind of a wireless package um, in our style of headphone, uh, non-waterproof because of the fact that water, water to, send, to send a signal, it won't go through water, uh, but we want to give the ability to have a good quality pair of headphones in wireless. Now, uh, they are available in quarter and uh, eighth inch, right? Uh, right now, uh, the uh, Equinox are only in the eighth inch because it's okay. a plug-in and they're the waterproof variety. So you actually have to spin the locking nut. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they're, those are only available in specific, but we do have land headphones in Patriot also that are a uh, quarter inch that are CTX compatible and they are uh, same design uh, with quality in mind so we but we haven't really said too much about them we we're very busy with just trying to keep the waters going <laughs> I bet you are I mean especially this time of year uh, do they, I don't know if waterproof uh, headsets have these or not, does it have the volume control on the uh, outer headset? Uh, you actually don't need them. Okay. It, okay. For my, pers my personal opinion was this when building it. Anything additionally that you add that you really don't need is one more thing that could cause a failure. Yeah. And that one caused failure could cause your vacation to be over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, phone lines are open. 270-495-0315. Call in if you've got a question for Joe. Hey Joe, what sets the uh, Patriot headphones apart from other headphones that people may be using? Um, well, I try not to compare them um, only because that's my business ethic um, is, you know, you, you only talk about your brand um, and then let the customers tell the rest of the story uh, because the customers potentially have used other brands or are using other brands, and then they may try your headphones. Um, but one of the, the most common things that I hear is that they're much louder than other headphones that are on the market. The sound quality and clear clarity are much better. Um, so, and and that's coming from the customers. Yeah. Um, and what know, and, and what, what accounts for that then? Design. Design. Yeah. Uh, because we we designed our headphones, the underwater's actually using music. A lot of headphone that are designed are just for making, you know, a sound. You know, if it makes a sound okay, it's good. But if you can plug these into music and you could tell what you're listening to uh, by the quality and the clarity of it, then you're, you've got it right where you want it. Hey, guys, we've got a call in. Last four numbers are 9024. Who have we got? This is Steve Slagle. Hey, Steve, how are you? I'm doing all right, Laura. Had good to hear from you all tonight. Yeah. Uh, you got a question for Joe that you want to ask? I do. Uh, I'm, first, I want to tell him congratulations on all those uh, wonderful coins he found. But I was wondering what other than coins was his favorite find that he has found in, in his career. Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I've. I have to say that there's there's just so many of them that 
See, because I, I like every, every aspect of detecting and treasure hunting. Um, so to try to pick one thing is, is very tough. Uh, but mm -hmm. you know, it's the Eagle breastplate. Okay. For, for land hunting, mm -hmm. uh, it's the $15,000 diamond wedding band from the beach. Uh, oh, wow. you know, it's, you have to take it into which part of detecting it is. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I have a wallet that I found back in 2002. I have that in my display case because the wallet was from the 60s because the license in it was 1963. Um, mm. It was found wow. on the beach. It still had the change in it, the money in it, the person's driver's license, their old metal credit card, uh, some pictures, and I have that actually on display in my display case. So, I mean, that's, and that's, something, awesome. that's something that really has no monetary value, but to see something like that come up, you know, what, uh, 20, 40, almost 40 years later um, on the beach. Man, that's, that's, that's unbelievable. I, I've only been detecting uh, seriously for probably a couple of years uh, already finding some stuff, but what amazes me most about metal detection in, in a beginner's eyes is holding the history in my hand that you know that someone else uh, during their lifetime uh, had in their hand. To me, that's that's what amazes me the most. Well, that goes back to the Disney. Mm -hmm. um, the half the half Disney. There's only. I'm not sure the exact number, but there's, there's a very limited number of these coins. This gentleman sold his coin at auction. His coin at auction, I believe, brought $38,000 mm -hmm. um, because it had a big scratch down it because he, he found it in a farm field, and the plow mm -hmm. had hit it at one point in time. Coins that were in a little better value... We're go at the time we're going for close to four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars. Wow, man! I'd like to get one in my pocket change. <laughs> <laughs> what what well, size? Thanks, of guys. I appreciate that. Right. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the call. Good call. Yeah. Good questions that You're you welcome. had there, and uh, we've got uh, we've got Charles on with us as well. Welcome to the show, Charles. Hey, thanks, Lloyd. Hey, Joe, how are you tonight? All right, and how about yourself? I'm doing good. I'm calling from Michigan, and uh, I'm a veteran, and I just wanted to say thanks for uh, working with the vets there and, and doing a good thing that way. I kind of remember your story from last year and the Patriot headphones, and, um, and uh, I was really uh, touched by that, I guess, and I just, I just appreciate that. You know, I... I go out on the town and I'm walking around. I see a vet. I love to shake their hands and say thanks. And uh, and when somebody uh, works with our vets and, and appreciates them like you do, then that's uh, that's just really what it's all about for me. And, and uh, I appreciate that. So I just want to call and say thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. And, and I think that, you know, all veterans, uh, due to sacrifices that they've made, need to have someone in their corner, <laughs> um, even if it's just something yeah. small, like getting them a cup of coffee um, at the local, uh, we have Wawa's, I don't know about you, but um, that's equivalent to like a 7-Eleven or uh, sure. gas and go, um, but just buying their cup of coffee, you know, it, it doesn't yeah. hurt, especially if you can afford it, you know, uh, some yeah. of these guys are well, really struggling with life. Yep. I, um, you know, I, I look for the guys with shirts or hats on and I seen uh, a guy at the Home Depot the other day and he had a, a Vietnam vet hat on and I went around as quick as I could and I caught up to him and, and I said, thank you and shook his hand. And he, you know, when they just hold your hand for too long and look you in the eye and glaze over and, and say, thank you for noticing 
that's what it's about. You know? Right. Be- that's, because that's why so we do it. Because for so long they've gone unnoticed. That's right. Um, yeah. The problems so, that they they have in day to day life is is not easy. Yeah. Hey, and uh, I I won't tell you to show up. We'll let somebody else call in. But um, on that note, we'll we'll give a shout out to Denny. Um, Joe, check out Denny's comments in the in the chat. He's got a recording of the moon landing from the Armed Forces radio broadcast. Um, <laughs> Then he never ceases to amaze me, man. That guy, he's, <laughs> he's done a bunch, and, and he's a good Vietnam vet. Um, and he he can touch base on just about anything you want to talk about, I think. So, um, Denny, thank you for your service, brother. And I would love to hear that uh, broadcast one day. And, um, Joe, keep up the good work, my man. And everybody out there, you have a good night tonight, okay? All right. Thank you, and I appreciate it. Yep, thanks for the call. Hey, Good thanks, night. Charles, for the call. And yes, uh, our. Bye bye, guys. Thanks. Uh, our thoughts and our thanks to all the veterans as well as all of you that are serving in law enforcement and uh, uh, any kind of public service like that uh, today because. Uh, we live in hard times, I tell you, and, uh, you know, it's always good to reach out to those people and let them know that we appreciate what they do. Right. Well, I, n- this next statement, I don't mean to be biased on uh, metal detector manufacturers, but from what I know, there's only one that actually gives a discount to our veterans. Uh, personally, I would like to see them all do something. Um, but right now, I mean, and I ask everyone that comes in who's looking at this brand if they've ever served, if they're a veteran, if they're even active duty, um, when they're purchasing to make sure that they get the most benefit that they have coming to them. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, some, some dealers do that. And I, I think it's great that, that, uh, the veterans get a, uh, a discount because they've, they've earned that discount. Hey, we've got another question. What can you tell us about the, uh, mind lab vanquish anything? Multi IQ for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> do what? Multi IQ for everyone. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I actually made I actually made some phone calls uh, to see what I could say, what I couldn't say, and um, I was I'm I'm sticking to those points. <laughs> okay, so I guess that's about what you can say. I'm sticking to those points. <laughs> uh, well, they did drop a new video the, uh, earlier today. Yeah, uh, or last night. Do do sign up for the contest that they they have going on. I, I would highly recommend. Um, if anything, it gets you, whenever there's a video going to drop, whenever there's any information that's going to come out about the Vanquish, uh, you'll be one of the first to know in an email. Yeah, and I signed up for that uh, the night before last. And then, of course, I've seen that one uh, commercial where uh, it shows the coal uh, floating over the ground and all the stuff coming up. So, Lloyd, all, we, all you need to do is get your pilot license, and then uh, man, we'll get both through them, and we're, we're good to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I know a little bit, and, and uh, kind of... Kind of like you, uh, I'll get to you there in just a minute, Denny. We got Denny on the line, uh, but I, I I've got a little bit of information, but it's all hush hush on the vanquish right now. Uh, I think that that will be coming out. Hopefully, uh, we can get Debbie to release some of that information at the Chattanooga show. We're going to have her on. I noticed people were talking about Debbie. We had Debbie on last year at the Chattanooga show. And uh, we will have her on one of the shows uh, coming up on the 27th. And by the way, guys, those shows will probably start about noontime uh, Eastern, uh, I would guess. That's what we did last year, didn't we, Jeff? Wasn't it about? 20? Yeah, it was. Re- yeah. yeah, well, I think we was going to start a little earlier, but uh, I was running all over Chattanooga trying to find the part <laughs> we forgot. And then, uh, well, I think it'll be about. Uh, 12 o'clock Eastern. Yeah, 12 o'clock Eastern and uh, and everything. Hey, what's going on tonight, Denny? 
Hey, great show again. Uh, hey, Joe, I got a question for you. What? How many uh, automatic car openers have you found in the water? <laughs> I wish I had a car to go with them. <laughs> you know, every time I get out of the water and I got one, I go around and try to open up guys' trucks, but they don't work, of course. <laughs> I think uh, well, about those poor guys. There's a $75 opener there they just lost. Well, don't, not even that. Think about the guy who goes down to the shore for the weekend. He rents uh, a place to stay, <laughs> yeah. and he he loses his key to his room. Oh yeah. Well, that that key they're already going to charge him twenty five dollars because he lost the oh, key yeah. to yeah. replace it. Because um, I've actually I've tried to return them to the hotels. Yeah. And the hotel's like, man, eh, you can just throw it away. We already charged the customer for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had that happen also. Yeah, But I mostly uh, detect uh, freshwater lakes. I don't get out in the ocean like you do. So, But uh, where I have, where I do hunt, uh, it's an old lake, uh, and I found over a 1,000 rings in that lake. And one of them I returned to a fellow in Florida. He was... Uh, I think 76 years old at the time, and he had lost it when he graduated from school in 1946. So that was a pretty special return. I never never met the man, but he uh, sent me a Christmas card every year. So uh, pretty cool. Well, yeah, we've, good story. We've had uh, lakes that have gone out uh, around us uh, over the years, and some of these lakes had amusement parks on them. Oh, yeah. Uh, the big water slides, uh, the slide down the hills. That's the one I'm uh, talking about. <laughs> things over the water. Um, yep. And when they've gone out, uh, I've, I've pulled rings from the 20s that were in there. You know, when you have a local high school that you find a class ring from 1921 or 1922, uh, y- y- there's no way to return it to its original owner so you then try to find who who the family members are right uh, and you know that's even tougher because the name changes um yeah. but you know it's it's always fun when you do your research and you know where you're digging yep and i uh, i actually had two two rings like that from dayton ohio and i had traced them back through your books to that area and the school and the lady even gave me their phone numbers and things of where they lived, and I never never got a response from them. So, and those were very nice gold rings, even the ladies back then. And I encourage uh, students even now, when they go to get their class ring, get a gold ring. Don't get a, a <laughs> silver plated ring. It's that's like, and if you lose, it's trying to like find a pull tab. But uh, well, gold ring, you've got something for the rest of your life, and you've got money in your hand. And also have it engraved with your name. Oh, exactly, for sure. Because uh, that ring I returned to that fella actually had his middle initial in it. He never advertised that initial. And when I told his name with his middle initial, he said, how do you know my middle initial? I said, because I have your ring on my finger. <laughs> that I found, and I asked him where he swam at, and he told me it was well, I was in the middle of a lake at a swim, a boat swim area, and uh, I said that's exactly where I found it. So right. pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, there's and for for that one story, how many other hundreds of thousands of rings are sitting in these lakes? Oh, tons. Back, <laughs> I'll be in the lake Monday morning, six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, yeah. You know, Even at 72, I'm still hitting her. I, I kind of laughed when you said you were, had an Explorer. I actually had a, uh, oh, I can't think of what mine lab had then. What was that? It, uh, anyway, it was always uh, on a on a rod, and I took I took it off a rod and made my own hip mount uh, machine and used it in Florida for a long time. But uh, it got some. It just got to be too heavy for me. And uh, actually, the only water machine I use now is the Tesaro Tiger Shark. And, and those gold one, rings and those gold necklaces and all those gold things you're talking about, that old Tiger Shark will still bring them out of the out of the water. Right, right. And that's why I was saying, you know, it's a it's a period of change, 
and the the first manufacturer we handled was Tesoro. Oh yeah, um, it's a shame and, they went out of business, but I'm still running mine. Well, so, and I have an Equinox, and I want one of your headsets. I can tell you that right now. I don't. I don't like. I've already had bad reports on. Excuse me, but Mind Lab. Uh, if you're listening, I've had a lot of bad reports on the headset itself. Uh, it's very hard to hear. The, the sound is not very loud. And they, the guys that told me they really wish there was a, a knob on the side that you could turn it up because the older people need to, to increase the sound. Without that uh, way of, uh, even you can't, uh, I have one of the guys, and he's uh, been in metal detecting for longer than I have. And he said that uh, he sold his Mind Lab a water detecting headset because it, he's no way to adjust it up for his uh, hearing. Well, so I'm sorry, yeah. I mean, I understand what you're saying. It might leak, but uh, come on now. I've got uh, a lot of them like that. Uh, that well, here's, you know, here's waterproof. A, a little bit of uh, just information. Yeah, um, I mean, I have, I, there's no way on the Equinox to turn up the volume loud enough for the older people to be able to listen and hear those weak signals. That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay. And uh, to get deep signals, even with the Equinox, you need that loudness um, in the water. Right, so, right. Well, I... I just was, a thought. What I was, right, what I was going to say is I had a gentleman who came in uh, Wednesday and his concern was that the headphones would not be loud enough. Exactly. Because he was, he was in the military, um, and he had some hearing damage. Right. And, so do I. And so. that was his concern. Um, yeah. After, you know, utilizing, because I, I keep one hooked up in the shop. My own unit has the Patriots on it. And he, was, he tried it, and he had to turn it down. Ah. He, he had to turn it down to 22. That's good. 20, 25 was just too loud, but 22 was comfortable. Okay. Well, I'll um, definitely but, be trying your headset, and I will get to this guy. And, uh, and he, he had been an excellent uh, speaker on this program because he's an old-timer, but he's been at it many years. And I'll give him the information. If they work for me, I'll be passing it on. Right, right. And... We, that's why we let our customers speak for the, – the customer speaks volumes over me being the manufacturer uh, because a customer is going to be honest, and sometimes they can be brutally honest if it's something that's not right. Um, but you'll find that they are probably going to be the most honest because they don't have anything in the game. Right. Uh, well, thank you for your time, Lloyd and uh, Jeff, another great uh, uh, program tonight. Charles, thank you for your kind words. Uh, and I do have the only recording of on, on the landing on the moon in Vietnam. On the, Actually, it, uh, they landed on the moon in Vietnam time. It was July 21st, 1969, not July 20th. We were a day ahead of the United States. And 500,000 men listened to that program on Armed Forces Vietnam Network. So, well, good night, gentlemen. Hey, uh, great, good night, Deanie. Great call, great. Deanie. Appreciate the yeah. call. All right, Lloyd. And appreciate, thank you for your service. Yeah, thank you thank for you. your service as well. All uh, right. Yeah. Uh, you're well, saying that uh, the volume on that is, is fixed on your headphones, but with the Equinox, you can actually turn it down with the volume control on the Equinox, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you know that's that's one of those things that we test every pair before they go in the packaging, and I'll sit here and I'll have them hooked up and and running, and I'll have people that'll come in, in and they're purchasing something and they're they look at me strange because they hear music, and they're looking around to see where it's coming from, and they're you know five feet away from the headset. Um, and I tell them, well, we, we've got headsets over here running so we can test them to make sure that, you know, there's not any kind of issues with right or left side, that the volume's about the same in both. Um, and that's, they're, they're like, uh, well, let me try a pair of those, you know, because they're looking for products also that they can recommend or a friend might be looking for a pair 
for uh, beach use or lake use. And that's all we can really do is, is we won't, like I said in the beginning, we won't run down another brand. We will only compare ours to what our customers say. Um, and it's the best policy. Yeah, that's good business. No doubt about it because, uh, you know, you don't want to get in, uh, you, you don't want to burn any bridges for sure. And, uh, you know, right. that's the way we are with all the other shows. We uh, we promote them and, and help them out, and I'm sure that you do that with all of the other brands and uh, and dealers, you know. Because, right. uh, you, you know, it's it's a marketplace, and if you make a good product, then uh, your product's probably going to sell. Right, and and I will say that we keep in stock other brands as well because of the fact that when a person comes in and is looking for something particular, then you want to supply them with what they're looking for. Um, if they don't know what they're looking for, then you would all obviously give them the options of what's available. Yeah. Joe, what is the uh, uh, cost of the Patriot headset? Uh, the headphones mm-hmm. uh, for non-water use are one thirty-five. The water headphones are one seventy-five. Well, uh, because they they're they're hand built um, in our shop, so it's it's all U.S. products except for components that we can't find in the U.S. or can't get in the U.S. Um, and we found it to be challenging uh, because we wanted all of our products to be from U.S. manufacturers. But what we were finding was that some of the U.S. manufacturers were not manufacturing. They were the middleman for another company. Um, so you were still we just bypassed them and went straight to the source to get the products. That's that's the best way to do it. I mean, it, I, I, you know, you get to looking at anything. If you go out there and want to buy exclusively exclusively from uh, America, it's hard to find any parts or anything that's made just in America. And then, uh, of course, your headset, all of it's made in America. So, I mean, that. That tells you right there, it should be a good headset. Well, we we look at it as if we're buying American parts, it's keeping Americans working. That's exactly uh, right. And and that's, you know, kind of where I am with that. Um, if, if I can put one person to work for one company, that's e- even if they're disabled – if they're a veteran, whatever their circumstance may be, that's one person that I'm helping. Yeah. Are you in the water right now? We're hearing frogs. Uh, we I thought you're on the houseboat. <laughs> no, no, I'm in the studio here, but I'm I'm hearing frogs too. <laughs> well, like I said, we had a thunderstorm come through, and it's been very hot, and I just stepped outside for a minute. Oh, okay, that explains uh, it then. It ain't a problem. I love it. It's a uh, it's a good addition to the episode to have that background right there. Nobody say anything for a little bit, and I'm gonna record a ten seconds, and then I'm gonna loop it all night. <laughs> 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 hey, Joe, that would be you, good you sleeping music? Yeah, it is. You have been a wonderful guest tonight. Just absolutely fabulous. Uh, before you get off, though. Uh, give out all of those uh, Facebook sites and websites and all of that. Uh, <laughs> that could take us a whole 15, 20 minutes. That's okay. We uh, got it. <laughs> Let's see. Let's start with uh, the business side. We have on Facebook, we've got metaldetecting.com. We also have our website page, which is metaldetecting.com. We also own mylab.tv. We also own uh, Let's Talk Metal Detecting, Let's Talk Beach and Water, uh, Mine Lab Equinox, Mine Lab Equinox User, uh, Mine Lab Equinox User Group. Um, I mean, there's Dig in South Jersey. Dig in South Jersey is one of the important ones for me um, because that's a communication that we have when it comes to our hunts. 
um, the uh, groups that we are in are also linked together. So if you go into one, you'll go into others. If you, without even, uh, if you go for permission, you're already granted it because you're already in one of the other groups. Um, it's a way that cuts down on just the sheer amount of work that I have to put in. Um, I'll step back inside. It'll make it a little quieter. Um, it's just there's a lot of groups out there that we're involved with, um, and we'll be doing some traveling. Uh, for example, we're going to be up at Radio World in September. We're going to be at Pound the Ground in October, and then we'll be at our event in October also. So our plate is pretty full with different things that um, we do because we're not just, you know, about self-promotion. Uh, we're about helping others uh, fill the needs that they have. Um, but we've got, oh, jeez, metaldetecting.com, Patriot Headphones. I'm also president of the South Jersey Metal Detecting Club, um, which has been around, I'm trying to think, it's been, what, since 1972, I believe, Um, and we're pushing forward with that club. Um, So, like I said, I got my hands in a lot of different things um, in the detecting community, uh, just because it it's it's my escape um, and enjoyment. Um, you know, you have some that you know enjoy you know going to a local bar or going to a local hangout. And me, I I like to to be out and in the community with the friends that I've I've met and the relationships that have been built on the detecting community. Um, you know, it's it's a small community, but it's, it's growing every day. Um, I get friend requests, probably two, three a day, uh, sometimes more, but we enjoy it. We, this is an, uh, an adventure that we enjoy. Because if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then you have to stop at, at some point because uh, it, it's not fun anymore. Yeah. And there for a while, it, it wasn't fun. Um, you get to a point in in your life, I guess, when you have to decide where do you want to be, what do you want to do, and this is what we chose. Um, because, to be honest, You can sit in a shop all day and just take phone calls and and take care of people's issues, Um, or you can be out just enjoying it yourself. Well, for me, I'd rather be here answering a phone call of the person that needs your help because they they may have purchased something from uh, an Internet site and they really don't know how to use it and you spend 15, 20 minutes talking them through it on the phone so that they get the mindset that they can do anything. They, you walk them through how to set things up. You walk them through um, different things about a detector that they purchased and not worry about what they purchased. You're trying to help them with what they purchased. Um, and they get, um, you get gratitude gratification knowing that, okay, that detector is not going to go sit in a closet now. That person is going to go out and actually use it, enjoy it, share it with his friends, uh, possibly uh, turn someone else on to purchasing from you in the future, but, you know, you do it for today, not for tomorrow. Well, yeah, well said. And uh, <laughs> hang on the hang on the line, uh, and we will say our goodbyes after we uh, close the show out. 
uh, I'll go ahead and let Jeff say his piece, and then I'll close everything out here. Well, I just want to thank Joe for uh, being our guest. He's been a great guest and uh, full of information. Uh, Thanks for the callers we had, and uh, thanks for everybody in the chat for uh, being here. This is what makes a show, you guys. So, I mean, thanks, everybody, and uh, have a good night. And we've got a big week planned for this next week. Uh, Half Redneck is coming up this next week. We're going to make a trip to Five Mile Holler. On Monday night, we have got Steve Zazulik on Relic Roundup, and he's talking about the release of his new book, The Ring Finder. Then on next Thursday night here on Relics Radio, we're going to have Darren Shell from Del Hollow Lake, and he is a historian, a very, very interesting guy. And then at the end of the week, this next week, which will be on Saturday, July the 27th. We're going to be at Chattanooga. And then he was asking, are we going to have call-ins? We probably will. We'll see if, I mean, we'll have all the equipment there. So we'll just see how that goes. But anyway, uh, if you like podcasts like this, be sure and check out Beyond Sight and Sound with Josh Kimmel on Sunday night and Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. All Metal Mode with Mike Hare and Gypsy Jewels, Monday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. American Digger Relic Roundup, Monday night at 9 o'clock Eastern with Butch Holcomb, Jeff Lupert, and myself. Hardcore Metal Detecting has shows on Thursday and Saturday at 8 o'clock Eastern with Derek Asklar and Craig Talley. And they're also doing some breakfast shows a couple of days a week. And then the newcomer to the podcast group is XP Team USA with Dave Kimball and Grant Hansen. And they're doing a show every other Friday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Relics Radio. We really do appreciate it. Be sure and join us live every Thursday night at 8 o'clock Eastern here on Spreaker, or you can catch the archive show at Relics Radio on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and many other podcast outlets. Relics Radio is also syndicated on the Cutting Edge Radio Network and is broadcast around the world. Please take a minute and hit the like button and be sure and follow us so you'll get notifications of all of our upcoming broadcasts. You can also find us on YouTube at Diggin' with 7 or Tennessee Jeff, or you can check us out on our Relics Radio Facebook group page or Adventures in History on Facebook. If you'd like to get in touch with us, then send an email to relicsradio at outlook.com. We'd love to hear from you. We hope that you'll join us next Thursday night. And until then, get out there and dig some history.